good evening, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let's start the last and final uh, panel of this Call to Europe event today in uh, Ljubljana. I welcome you back after the short interval. And um, I believe uh, the panelists you can see on stage doesn't need introduction in Ljubljana. Uh, I welcome Tanja Fajon, who's the leader of the Social Democrats in uh, Slovenia and a member of the European Parliament. But we... And we also have online Maria Joao Rodriguez, uh, the president of the Foundation for European Progressive Studies, a former member of the European Parliament and a former minister uh, from Portugal. Maria is connecting with us from uh, Lisbon. Good evening, Maria. Good evening. Pleasure to see all of you. Thank you very much uh, for joining. And uh, let me refer back to the start of uh, the conference when I was saying that we are going to frame the discussion around the conference on the future of Europe. Why? Because in 2021, but also in 22, this is going to be a major engagement of European leaders, member of the European Parliament, uh, but other officials and activists with the European citizens in order to discuss the longer term future of uh, the European Union, because so many crises are behind us, and some of these crises indeed left a mark on confidence uh, among the European people uh, towards the EU institutions. Sometimes this confidence was shaken. And um, I can quote uh, Gabriela Bischoff, also a member of the European Parliament, who wrote in this progressive yearbook 2021 published by FEPS, that this is somehow a last chance, this conference on the future of Europe, to reconnect and rebuild uh, uh, the confidence. Uh, Maria Joao Rodriguez, um, uh, who is with us online, um, was the creator of one of the great initiatives of the recent period in the European uh, P Union, which is called the uh, European Pillar of Social uh, Rights. I believe uh, Maria, in her initial intervention, is going to give us uh, a few uh, important thoughts um, about um, uh, the FEPS vision and her personal vision about the future of uh, Europe and including very important emphasis on social rights. Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, my warm greetings from the other side of the continent. I'm right now speaking from Lisbon, uh, but great pleasure to join all of you. Special greetings to Tanya Fayon, my good friend, and also to Monica uh, Gleiva and all the progressive friends in Slovenia. Look, I've been in Slovenia many times in my life, starting with the fall of the Berlin Wall. And I love this country. I was with you, as you know, last September. And, uh, and now I'm coming again uh, online uh, because uh, I was uh, uh, blocked in my flight uh, due to the Omicron uh, uh, variant. But here we are, and uh, let me start by underlining that uh, we need a progressive Slovenia. We need it because uh, Slovenia has always been a key reference in the eastern part of Europe, in the Balkans uh, region. Uh, and uh, we had a progressive Slovenia, and uh, we need to have it again, to have it back. And right now we have this uh, historical battle taking place in your country uh, and the new coalition is coming, fighting for the future of the Slovenian uh, people. And I'm so pleased to see uh, our friends from the progressive family leading all these big political uh, battle. You can count on us. What is at stake for Slovenia right now? Look, first of all, on the health front, what is at stake is to know if Slovenia can have a government pushing for European coordination to tackle the pandemics or going back to a kind of nationalistic reaction. 
What is at stake also is that uh, we are launching recovery plans everywhere and also in Slovenia, but recovery for us is also about transformation. It's about the green transition, making the best of the digital revolution, while tackling social inequalities, and in fact, using the European pillar of social rights to address these old and new social inequalities. But uh, in order to uh, cope with the health challenge and to the, cover, the recovery and the transformation, we need to have open debate in Slovenia. We need to have uh, quality press, free press, and we need to have real democracy. So at the end of the day, this is the big issue at stake in Slovenia. And uh, we count on uh, the progressive forces or the democratic forces to change the situation and to bring Slovenia back to its role of a progressive beacon in Eastern part of Europe. The purpose of this conference is also to bring the European debate to Slovenia. Uh, we have uh, so far uh, count on the Slovenian presidency of the council, but the debate around European issues must be much deeper in Slovenia. And that's why I'm so pleased that uh, the Foundation of European Progressive Studies, FAPS, with Progressiva, could organize such a high quality conference. And uh, we are bringing to you this uh, book prepared by FAPS, a uh, good group of experts to explore real progressive solutions for Europe. And our main conclusion is that we are going and we need to go to a new phase of the European project. First of all, because we need to invent this new development model with the green and digital transition and keeping social cohesion. Secondly, because we need to have uh, a united Europe, starting with the membership of the um, um, Balkan region and bringing together all our European partners. Also because we need to have a strong commitment with multilateralism to cope with these new global challenges. But at the same time, we don't have the means. And we need to have the financial means and we need to have the political means. On the financial means, recently, Europe could finally agree on a qualitative leap with a stronger budgetary capacity, uh, backed by common issues of debt and new own resources but we need to make it permanent because we need to have a long-term investment capacity. And uh, on the top of this, we also need to make sure that national budgets, they have the room of maneuver to invest in the future and to create new jobs, quality jobs, particularly for young people. And uh, we know that all these ambitious agenda can only be moving forward if we have a qualitative leap also on democracy. First of all, by ensuring full respect of rule of law. And uh, the free press is one of the basic conditions for real democracy. Secondly, making sure that uh, European Parliament is strengthened in its competencies. And finally, developing much more participatory democracy. The Conference on the Future of Europe is the first step in this direction. But let me conclude with the following terms. Right now, we have an historical battle, political battle taking place in Europe because we have conservative forces still led by uh, European popular party, which are delaying and delaying and blocking the right kind of decisions we need to have in Europe. 
Beyond this, we have now a new political movement, the far right movement, uh, which um, is coming with a dangerous message, arguing they can protect people. Look, this is a big illusion, a big mistake, because what they are doing is to build up a new kind of political system, authoritarian one, which is sacrificing uh, freedom, social cohesion, and the rule of law. And this we cannot accept. But there is a third political position in Europe, extremely important, the progressive family. And the progressive family is uh, pushing for this new phase of the European project. And uh, this is a strong family. We have strong positions in the north of Europe, in the southern Europe, now in Germany. So my last message for you is that you are not alone. On the contrary, you can count on powerful forces pushing for a progressive direction in Slovenia. So uh, we really count on you. And I'm so pleased to see Tana Fayon, uh, my dear friends and member of the European Parliament, able to bridge between European politics, progressive European politics, and strong progressive push for a progressive government in Slovenia. So you can count on us and Tanya, all the best for your work, excellent work. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Maria. Please stay with us because I will come a little bit later uh, with a question to you. Uh, now I would like to invite Tanya Fayon uh, to share her thoughts um, about the current political junction, what Europeans should think about Slovenia and what Slovenians should think about Europe. Thank you, uh, Laszlo, and thank you, dear Maria for being with us and always offering uh, your support to progressive forces to social democrats in Slovenia. This support that is coming from our sister parties, our families from around Europe is currently extremely important. I will start my opening remarks on an optimistic note because just today we received the news that is a good hope for the progressive forces in Europe that Germany will have first time ever in the history a government led by social democrats that is gender balanced government, meaning 16 ministers, eight females. And this is something that we can be proud of, not only the gender balanced government, but also that we are as progressive family in Europe, taking back in a way the lead as a, a force that give hope back to our citizens. And I think this is very important. The discussion on the future of Europe comes at a very crucial time. You said it well, it's a last chance. That means that the alarm is really um, ringing. We had several crises in the past, um, in the last 10, 20, 30 years. And it seems that we are just going from one crisis to another crisis. And we are just trying to to put the water on the fire and when already the new crisis evoke. And we never managed to resolve the crisis. And throughout this time, I feel we lost what is the strategic interest of the European integration. So coming back to the roots why we are in Europe as countries together, what is holding us together? Solidarity, equality, Maria said it very well, we are now facing challenges of social inequalities, of exclusion. We have climate change. We have, um, we have a heavy pandemic that hit us all, hit all our economies. We are going through very challenging times and we lost a lot of confidence of our citizens in the EU institutions, in the politics in general, also due to inequality is that the euro became a continent that is extremely rich but the wealth among the citizens is not distributed fair enough we have a lot of rich classes societies companies name it business strong business and on the other hand 
there is growing poverty. And throughout pandemic, these inequalities are even rising further. Throughout environmental changes, these um, inequalities are rising further. So we are going through big changes where we lack a lot of confidence in general among the EU governments, among the EU institutions, among the citizens. And we have to reconnect back if we don't want to lose this European integration that is an extremely important project. I like to remind people that European Union got a, a Nobel, not a, got a, yeah, got a prize award for the peace and stability. Sometimes it may be sound too, not, I wouldn't say pathetic, but something that we tend to forget. But this is the core of our integration, why we are together to protect our citizens, to bring them solidarity back, to protect them against environmental changes, to ensure social just transition, what we have today on the agenda, digital transformation, green transformation, where we are putting all these enormous, we just reached an ambitious historical deal on the recovery plan, a lot of money, will be distributed to our countries. In Slovenia, I regret to see and say that we have no public debate whatsoever with the citizens, with the think tanks, with the NGOs, with the experts, how to spend this money. When the government was doing the national recovery plan, how to get the European funds that will be very substantial. When you have to have a big picture in front of you, how you will invest the money. Um, for the development of our country, we failed, I would say. We didn't use this opportunity that was offered to us. And I sincerely hope that we will manage as progressive forces in our country to rebuild the trust with citizens. And in the next year, we will, I will say, Maria, you mentioned Slovenia's role. I think we will have historical elections in Slovenia. It will be like plebiscite. People will be deciding whether we want to go further in autocracy or back to democracy, whether we want to restore human rights, fundamental rights, rule of law, um, independence of judiciary, freedom of media. This is all what is at stake, not only in Slovenia, but in many countries in our region. Just today, there was another attempt to forum far right political group in Europe. You know that this is a serious attempt ongoing for several months now. Today in Warsaw, they're supposed to meet the leaders of our right group to establish a new, as far as I know, Salvini didn't show up. And the whole attempt as it looks, uh, the, the government or the radical forces played a, a, a little bit water down the, the attempt. But if that would happen, and I wouldn't exclude that, the, of course, attempts will go on to form the far right political family group in Europe. That means that in the European Parliament, we will have the third biggest um, political group that will be far right. And this is not far from it. And these are the dangers we are all facing in, in Europe when we are discussing how to engage citizens back to our project, how to bring politics from the bottom to the top, how to make people understand that it's important how we create our future together for the well being of younger generation. And I very much lack the debate on the future of Europe in Slovenia. Frankly, I tell you, we don't have any. For the years I'm in the European Parliament, this is my third mandate. I don't remember if I participated at two or three events organized by the government or, I don't know, the president of Slovenia or the institutions that we would together with citizens, not politicians, with the citizens, with the expert society, discuss what is at stake. Slovenia is a small country. For us, honestly, I think we are extremely vulnerable. We are connected to the big economies. We have an um, economy that is very much export oriented. So we depend from strong and united Europe. We are very vulnerable. That is why I think we have to discuss what role of Slovenia we see in the future of Europe. And we have to find a balance what kind of Europe we want to see in 10, 20 years from now on. What are our shared responsibilities? Now we know through pandemic that health systems are in the national 
authority, domain. Why we fail to properly just distribute vaccination or why we close down in egoistic ways our borders in EU was exactly because we didn't have enough of coordination. And for all these crises that are occurring, we need to have more coordination and especially strong leadership. We have weak institutions and we have now the governments that maybe they say something for a long time in Europe or in Brussels, they go back home, they execute completely different politics and nothing happens to them. This is in the case of Poland, this is in the case of Hungary, where we have for years now the discussion whether we want to invoke Article 7. We know that no one wants to invoke it because it's like an atomic bomb. And now we are discussing whether we should connect the whole rule of law with a financial mechanism not to pay money to countries that are breaking the European values. And even here, the discussion and the debate is extremely sensitive because at the end of the day, you cut very important, significant financial resources to the citizens and the projects of the country because of the failure of the governments. So now a lot to be said, but just maybe to underline, I think we really have to have an open debate with our citizens um, to have a very transparent debate I see big challenges how to reconnect um, politics and citizens. We discussed it for years, but European politics is usually the one that is close to people's hearts because it's not tangible enough and they don't see um, changes next day or in uh, weeks or months to come. But we are just at the end of EU presidency. It's our second exercise. And I can tell you at the end of presidency, you will hear um, most probably glorious um, statements of our um, responsible politicians, I mean the government, how well we did it. The reality is that on administration level, the presidency works fine. These are our diplomats in Brussels, quite often underestimated. They work fine, we didn't have a big issues on the table because there were no big expectations. Uh, we didn't have challenging dossiers because there were not big expectations. What are the heavy fires are in the next periods to come? But what is really problematic, and I see it often in Brussels, is the image of Slovenia. That is extremely undermined with this government. When you have to really apologize for the statements of public officials that are offending, that are discrediting, that are lying to our foreign friends. And this bad reputation that in fact, I think it's much stronger present in Brussels than in Slovenia, we have every time we are in Brussels somehow to defend. And I think this will be left our EU presidency. So the lost opportunity very much lost opportunity. And um, I don't like to finish my remarks with a pessimistic note. I think we have a big responsibility, all of us, in Slovenia, in other EU countries, especially progressive forces, because we have to bring back Europe to our citizens. We have to make them understand that it's not only peace and stability, but finally, today we live in a 21st century. We have same global challenges all around us. And not a single country can really fight these challenges on its own. Be it again, digital transformation, climate change, be it security issues, be it migration issues, be it simply bringing back solidarity and fundamental rights to our citizens. So this is our responsibility. And even if we are a small country, we can do big things and I, want to be optimistic that we will manage. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I believe we have a few more minutes uh, left from the program and I would like to use my privilege to ask a question uh, from each of you, Maria as well as uh, Tanya. Uh, Maria, I know uh, you study a lot the recovery policies of the European Union. And um, we very often discuss how to build back better. 
And I think this is this is an expression coming from America, but we can use it. And uh, and my question would exactly be uh, in two years time or five year times, uh, how shall we measure or how shall we determine whether we really manage to build back better after this uh, crisis? And let me also uh, ask the question to Tanya, uh, because she said that she wants to leave on an optimistic note and not a pessimistic uh, uh, one. And she also mentioned the Nobel Prize of uh, the European Union. I think another Nobel Prize is waiting for somebody who will be able to solve the integration of the so-called Western Balkans to uh, the European Union. Um, in order to have uh, an, an optimistic conclusion, Tanya, why don't you give us just a few ideas after uh, Maria answered the question about building back better. Maria, you start. Thank you very much, uh, Lazo, for your question. Indeed, uh, and I know uh, that as Tanya was underlining, uh, in Slovenia, the debate on the recovery plan is very poor, is very uh, hidden in the corridors of the government. And I can tell you this is not at all the case here in Portugal, where we have a socialist government and where we had a very large consultation to prepare our recovery plan. So uh, let me tell you what I'm seeing from all over Europe, because uh, with FEPS, we are working with many other foundations and member states exactly on this issue. How can we build that better? Look, we know that climate change will require a big transformation in many sectors, transports, energy, housing, um, and, uh, Sometimes these will, um, in fact, close some companies and some jobs. But on the other hand, it is proved that we can have an uh, opportunity to, to create much more jobs and quality jobs in new activities. But for this to happen, we need to have active industrial policy, active innovation policy. We cannot just let the market work alone. The second issue is about the digital transformation, because the digital transformation is um, transforming the way we live, we work everywhere. And the first thing is to make sure that people working on online platforms or in telework, so many now, they can count on decent working conditions and they can keep their connection with social protection. And the third thing is about skills and new jobs, particularly for young people. Uh, because uh, the jobs to be created will require new skills. And again, we need to have very active education and training uh, policy. All this is foreseen in the action plan to implement the European Pillar of Social Rights. But this needs to be discussed in, this, in each country. So for Slovenia, it's really uh, crucial that the recovery plan will involve a large consultation for civil society, for citizens at large. Uh, there is a last point I'd like to make is um, at the end of the day, um, the big criteria will be what kind of jobs will be created and what kind of welfare system for the 21st century uh, will be created. And this can only be solved with strong European coordination. Thank you very much, Maria. Tanya, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Laszlo. You didn't give me really the easiest question to speak on with a lot of optimism, so I will try to be creative um, on the Western Balkans and integration. First of all, I would like to say that for me personally, it's extremely important to speak about enlargement and to believe that these countries of Western Balkans have always been part of Europe and they will always be part of Europe. And we need them as much as they need us, especially in the time of big challenges ahead of us. We have to strongly work with each other. It's not only about 
strengthening political or economic ties, but mostly people-to-people -people contacts. Um, enlargement, unfortunately, was in the last few years um, the question of uh, fatigue because um, many European governments on one hand had much bigger issues and the whole EU had much bigger issues to discuss and we neglected. Um, we didn't find a common language or uh, proper solutions. So the reform process was slow. Um, the whole enlargement um, accession process was not tangible enough for people to understand. Just opening and closing the chapters, it doesn't bring um, EU integration close to the citizens on the other hand of the Western Balkans. So you see in the Western Balkans, um, a lot of uh, economic challenges now with COVID, you see the um, young uh, brain drain, people living because of lack of vision. You see the distrust, you see growing nationalism, growing um, um, disbelief in the EU institutions. Why also? Because we delivered several promises in the past and we didn't um, fulfill them. Very frankly, I remember at least five, six years ago, the first one that we broke was when we said to citizens of Kosovo, once you meet the technical criteria, we will abolish visas for citizens. They met the criteria. They did a very sensitive decision on demarcation of the border with Montenegro government almost fell. They did everything, but the EU government stopped and blocked it. It was years ago. Then we had not, I mean, again, years ago, we said North Macedonia, Albania, you are ready also to start the accession talks, not to mention that North Macedonia is, negoti start, are, is discussing to start negotiations for more than 15 years, maybe by now. And this is a bizarre thing. And now again, the government fell or will fall, or I mean, it's a lot of political instabilities in North Macedonia, but again, we are not delivering to both countries. Um, there was a big hope that by the end of Slovene presidency, we might make a positive step for North Macedonia and Albania, um, especially because France is coming and France is uh, rather um, on the break when it comes to the enlargement. So it will be more difficult to make progress. Now, I, am, I want to, to remain um, optimistic, but I see like the, the, the policy to the Balkans, to the enlargement is a little bit drifting away because I don't know what else we can still do if we want to deliver our promises as soon as possible. And I just hope that the EU governments will realize what is at stake and take this political courage, um, at least to allow these two countries that really did everything that we asked them to start the accession talks. It's only a start, it takes years. It's difficult to explain people in the Balkans that we are serious about the enlargement. And I do hope, I mean, we as progressives here, we were always the front runners speaking about the enlargement and we will stay. And I do hope that with more governments in Europe that we will manage to do also a breakthrough here. I'm not sure with Thais, we have actually a lot of discussions lately. He's eager on the Balkans and I'm very happy to have Western Europeans in Foreign Affairs Committee. I tell you that in the last mandate, we are less and less politicians, European, that we still are eager to deal with the enlargement because we don't see the final positive result. And that is one of them. So I'm very happy that I have a good support also. Um, so we will um, gather strong forces and just continue pushing on one hand, the EU governments, um, where is a lot of political inconsistency and incredi not credibility. And on the other hand, the people of the Western Balkan to deliver really what we have promised. I mean, not to forget that the EU is the biggest donor financially in, in the region. And even that we are not able to properly communicate. So the EU doesn't have a good image in the region. And that also means that people somehow um, don't have um, a big trust to the EU institutions down there. So I could talk lengthily, but just to be aware that it's a growing instability 
in the region, just to look to Bosnia and Herzegovina and around. It's not excluded that new tensions can come, not to mention some bloody wars that they lived 20, 30 years ago. We don't want to see in our neighborhood. So that is what we have to have in mind. Thank you very much for this sense of uh, realism, uh, which uh, you shared with us. I think it is very, very important. But uh, you also demonstrated together with Maria Jo Rodriguez that to be progressive means to have ideas, values, policies, and what you stressed also courage. And I think if we stay with this uh, message that we need all this in consistency, we will make progress in uh, the coming years. Uh, dear friends, I would like to thank uh, Maria Jo Rodriguez uh, from Lisbon. And Tanya Fayan, who very kindly shared her time with us. All these wonderful thoughts about the present and the future of uh, the European Union. I also would like to thank everybody who uh, participated in today's discussion in the previous two uh, panels on healthcare as well as media uh, freedom. Um, this has uh, been, I think, a remarkable um, event uh, in cooperation between uh, Drus for Progressiva as well as Friedrich Ebert Stiftung and the Foundation for European Progressive Studies from uh, Brussels. Um, I would also like to thank the work of the interpreters, uh, without whom we couldn't manage sometimes, and um, uh, I wish uh, everybody uh, a safe journey home, which is sometimes difficult in the COVID times, but let's do it also together. Thank you so much again, and let me give you this souvenir uh, from FEBS, the book about the uh, Thank <laughs> you.